So that today's presentation will be importance of LCMS in uh, drug discovery. You know, uh, as the society name is Chromatographic Society of India, because this chromatographic uh, technique stand alone will not be able to give you uh, uh, complete information sometimes. It was fine during the HPLC days where, you know, only the HPLC and, uh, was there. But what you should know is there was UV component there, which is a detector. Now, mass spectrometry, earlier uh, it was only a structure determination uh, component of the sign. But uh, later on, uh, the evolution turned it to be one of the useful detectors. The, what I was trying to say was, you know, when uh, in the olden days, uh, HPLC was having a UV detector and then came other detectors. So, mass spectrometry evolved itself as a detector. So, it was very thinkable that the MS can be coupled to LC, like a UV. So, it became LCMS. So, don't think LCMS as something different other than the chromatographic technique. Right now, what we are talking is the uh, chromatographic uh, uh, applications only of LCMS. But since I have worked a lot in uh, drug discovery field, so what I thought is in this webinar, let me share a lot of my experience, what I gathered in Singapore and in India, AstraZeneca, everywhere, and uh, assimilate that into uh, one big story and uh, tell to uh, my uh, colleagues and friends. And uh, I think the students will get immensely benefited with this uh, presentation if everything goes well in today. Hopefully, I will pray for that. I'll go to the start of the slide now. Since I'm talking of uh, drug discovery, you know, drug discovery is not a very uh, simple uh, research. What you would uh, you must be hearing is, it is uh, uh, up to 15 years it may take to get one molecule into the market. And if you look at the cartoon, all the way, you know, by the time one drug gets approved. So it is a very, very uh, time consuming and uh, inefficient process. So maybe only about 0.01% success rate is there. That is why it is very important to test lots of compounds right at the beginning. And when you want to test lots of compounds, it is very important that you know you should test uh, more and more and more and compounds. So you have to be very, very fast. So that fast chromatography etc. becomes very important. So during the webinar, you will uh, uh, learn about those things. Okay, so uh, analytical scientists, they have got very vital role. Earlier days, you know, analysis means, you know, the sample will come to QC lab and uh, someone uh, will test and give the result. No, no, it's not like that at all. Analytical scientists have become very important, at, at least in the term discovery scenario. And when you, this uh, the cartoon here shows that, you know, what is the failure, failure rate in the drug discovery? If you could take 10, those 10,000 compounds, for 39% will fail due to pharmacokinetics. 29% will fail due to efficacy of the thing. And the animal toxicity, 11%. That means in every field, including the commercial, 5% failures are there. So that means every field contributes for the failure of the drug. And 90% uh, of the failures, they have input from the analyst. That's the reason analysts are very important and attrition due to efficacy is uh, very, very high. So you will have to be... Uh, Efficacy and toxicity, you will have to test as early as possible. That is possible only when you use the LCMS technology. Okay, so what is the analytical use of uh, mass spectrometry? Because before we jump on to LCMS, let us understand a bit from the MS background. So in the early 20th century, mass spectrometry was mostly used by the physics people uh, to determine, you know, the, the structure, you know, understanding the atoms, molecules, their uh, orbits and all those things. So the physician, physics they used to use, you know, sector mass spec was the very, very first one. So physics, physicists used to determine the atomic structure using the mass spec. So the key role in the development of atomic energy is due to the mass spec only. So if you are seeing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, power stations and uh, atomic power stations, uh, they all have been research happened on the, using the mass spec as one of the components. So in 1940s, in 1940s, this identification and quantification of only the organic uh, compounds used to happen, and then only these the commercial grade uh, instruments appear. Otherwise, it was only the research grade instrument. And until 1990, it was only the. If you see the literature now, you will see only the organic molecules that were being uh, determined. That should be volatile. That was one of the initial restrictions. 
solutions for the MOSFET. Okay, because then available ionization processes like EI and the CI and Spectre, they were unable to take this uh, aqueous medium into the MOSFET. That's why it was only the volatile organic compounds that were used. Then in the research literature, you know, recent literature, it uh, you will see a lot of biological applications. That is when you know the MS became more of biological uh, biologist tool. So I said it is uh, evolution of the LCMS. It was more of a chemist tool, which I explained now, and uh, the development of this LCMS technique. It was a natural corollary because you started using the aqueous buffers and all. So the classical LC in this mobile phase, what you see is. Most of the you all know it is only the phosphate purpose most of the time. So, but those phosphate purpose would not be used in the modern LCMS, uh, which I will explain later. So, and the difficult separations which are uh, uh, employed, they you can use a lot of iron pairing agents. Again, the iron pairing agents will be uh, the non-volatile in the initial days. So that has to be changed. So non-volatile salts will hamper the ionization, which you will see in some of the slides later. <laughs> So in 2002, you got the uh, chemistry Nobel Prize to three very important uh, scientists. One is uh, John Fenn, who got uh, who invented this electrospray uh, ionization source, and the uh, second one is the Koichi Tanaka, who is uh, invented this uh, time of flight mass spectrometer top, and the third one is the Kurt Woodridge, who is the NMR scientist. Because the NMR also nowadays has a lot of application in uh, drug discovery, biology, and proteomics and all. So all these uh, people, the spectroscopists, uh, so to say, one is the mass, two are the mass spectroscopists, and one is the NMR spectroscopist. All these three people, uh, they deserve those. Uh, and on this teacher's day, I think uh, we all should give our gratitude to these big teachers who is uh, enabling the drug discovery as what it is today. And this is the, the important paper, electrospray ionization mass spectrometry uh, by this uh, Fenn and Mom, which has revolutionized the mass spectral application in the drug discovery. So, uh, having given that much of uh, preamble kind of thing, let us understand what is, how do the LCMS instrument looks like? Because I understand there are a lot of uh, students also around there and uh, many of them may not have had a chance to see how an LCMS looks like. So let me just explain. The, uh, for your information, the, this is the LCMS uh, instrumentation setup which I had put uh, in when I went to uh, Singapore in uh, 2006. And this is a real uh, workhorse. And I'll just pinpoint uh, part by part here. What you will see on big box here, I'm marking here uh, with the mouse. That is the mass spec part. Okay. And you will see uh, there inside, uh, there will be the uh, uh, other... Uh, water poles and other things and what you see as an attachment here the SS1 that is the ionization source this is the electrospray ionization source and this is our uh, heart of the whole machine that is the HPLC uh, this is where you know all the separation etc will happen there is a small compartment here you can see in that about 5 centimeters and the small columns will be treated inside and this one big uh, one it is an auto sampler only you can see a lot of trays here they will have uh, hundreds of wires inside so the robot will come and uh, pull out the wire tray and uh, inject the sample so this is and these are the mobile cases in the vacuum and other things over there so this is how a typical lcms instrumentation will look like so let me read out here what are the lcms components the front end will be the hvlc which i'm showing here and then there is a auto sampler connected to the hvlc and in the mass spectrometer what i was showing there will be ionization shows which I showed here, electrospray ionization. Classical ionization sources are electron impact ionization, chemical ionization. These will go mostly with the GC. So there will be GC MS uh, the chromatography. Then GC chromatogram will be the analyzed with the mass detection. That will be the GC MS. And these two are the important ionization source, electrospray, electron impact, and chemical ionization. And this is uh, most of the uh, our uh, drug discovery and biologist uh, domain. Electrospray ionization, ESI or nano ESI. ESI is a short form for electrospray ionization. And nano ESI is a miniature version where you will, can deal only with the microliter samples. Here you will deal with the ML samples. Then if there is an improvement on this electrospray ionization. Uh, it is atmospheric pressure chemical ionization, APCI. This APCI is something equivalent to chemical ionization in this form. Then there is this atmospheric pressure photo ionization because some of the molecules 
they may not uh, ionize well because you know it, success of a uh, mass spec analysis depends on the ionization. So if it is not ionizing properly in any of these techniques, you use this APPI where you know you activate the molecule with the uh, photo ionization. You bombard with the some specific light uh, ray and then you ionize it. So that is how APPI is used. And these are uh, fast atom bombardment. It is a kind of uh, classical technique now. It is not uh, very popular, uh, uh, but now it is further developed as uh, MALDI, matrix resistant laser desorption ionization. MALDI. Uh, this is a very popular uh, uh, mass spec uh, technique where ionization is used by a different uh, principle other than the electrospray, where laser is put on the molecule and the molecule will get spurted up and the ions will enter into the mass spec. And this is mostly used by the protein techniques. Okay. Then the mass analyzers. I said in this mass spec there will be analyzers. There are uh, various analyzers. They are called as, you know, water pool uh, uh, analyzer, ion trap analyzer, top analyzer, and uh, research grade was Fourier transfer uh, MS analyzer, and the magnetic sector. FTMS and magnetic sector, again, as I initially said, it is more of a research grade one. And uh, water pool and ion trap uh, are very popular in our uh, LCMS application. Top is mostly, as I said, is in the multi, multi is attached to the top most of the time. Multi top will go for proteomics. And there will be huge uh, improvement in terms of data analysis uh, software, which will allow us to analyze the raw data that is acquired using these techniques and decipher a lot of good information, which I will uh, demonstrate in one of the examples later. Okay, I said earlier that uh, uh, you are analyzing 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 kind of uh, compounds to get one drug molecule at the end. So everything has to be done very fast. You know, now the demand is, you know, you are making the compound today, but the people want the result yesterday. That is the kind of uh, situation. So the, and you will know that most of the people still run because of the compendium requirement. HPLC uh, flow, etc. in HPLC analysis will run up to 40, 45 minutes. So that kind of uh, the chromatography will not work for uh, these uh, drug discovery uh, LCMS uh, application. So this fast chromatography is very, very uh, important component and it is inevitable. So modern drug discovery is based on high throughput process. So the mass spectrometric analysis uh, is uh, very quick, but LC will take the time, as I explained. So to make that uh, quick turnaround time, I showed you in that compartment there will be a small column. Five centimeter columns are the very standard column. You know, 2.1 mm or 4.6 mm dia with five centimeter. There's the short columns. So these are the standards of the day today now. And uh, there are a lot of new generation columns are also having coming. You know, not, we know that you know most of the columns we talk of only C18. But you know, the, other than regular C18, in the C18 also a lot of uh, modifications happen and the heat of uh, these uh, vendors, you know, they all will uh, show some of the important improvements so that your uh, chromatographic peaks will be very sharp and uh, even though you do a very fast uh, chromatography. Okay. Then uh, there are these high throughput uh, uh, columns are also there, pixel function columns are there so that, you know, you don't have to change columns in a C18, C8 and all. In the true uh, drug discovery stage, uh, these mixed function columns also will be very versatile so that you don't have to do a lot of method development. And the capillary columns will allow you, you know, the nanomolar sensitivity. Okay, then uh, if we go to a doctor, they will always say it is good for your heart to have the less salt. And uh, if you don't be able to uh, take the salt, it will be much, much better. So less salt is good, no salt is better as applied to our health. But the same is true with our mass spec as well, you know. In, uh, 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 I will explain later in uh, the, how the ESI works, where these terminals will come in. In the cone voltage has a great effect on the mass spectra and the source design is very, very important. It is modified. Uh, earlier, you know, they used to just uh, send the mobile case into the mass spec tray, but now they have made it a geometry change. Uh, Dr. Rama is uh, one of the pioneers in uh, improving these uh, designs. So in this uh, the orthogonal geometry, even though little bit of salt, etc., comes in because from the mobile phase or the non-volatile matter, directly your source will not be affected. So that is the beauty of uh, this uh, change. So the use of volatile buffer will eliminate all these uh, problems. So as I said, HPLC, uh, you see most of the time you are using, you know, 
फॉस्टेट पर्पज विच आर नॉट वर्टाइल एंड युअर कोन ओल्ड कोन एंड कर्टन प्लेट्स एक्सेट्रा विल बी कोटेड विथ दी फॉस्टेट सॉल्ट एंड देन युअर आयनायझेशन एफिशियन्सी विल ड्रॉप डाऊन सो टू वर्क अराउंड इट Uh, there is a development that you know buffers are uh, changed completely from non volatile to volatile buffer so if you are using the phosphate you change it to acetate if you are using sodium potassium etc you go to ammonium acetic so ammonium acetate uh, formate formic acid all these things are very popular nowadays okay so ammonium acetate and uh, trichloroacetic acid and formic acid these are the very common uh, mobile phase components nowadays that is uh, being uh, used in lcms so the iron pairing agents you know that you know all these uh, uh, positive mode iron pair agents like you know like in this uh, surfactant based you know all those uh, uh, tetraethyl uh, hepta uh, amine and octal all those things uh, are non volatile and used only in the classical hpsc but now you will have to think of you know volatile iron pairing agents also so that you know you can uh, use them in the lcms so these iron pairing agents are talking about tetra tetra propyl ammonium tetra butyl ammonium i have rather read them triethyl ammonium trimethyl octadiethyl ammonium salts these are the acidic analytes and uh, for the acidic analytes alkyl sulfonic acids for the basic analytes so this uh, if we increase these concentrations now uh, they decrease uh, their uh, retention will not be uh, sufficient if you decrease the concentration so but if you uh, increase the concentration you cannot uh, use them then the tetraethyl ammonium salts uh, they form the cluster ions with the anionic analyte so the aliphatic amines are suitable to use as volatile ionic agents so this is the change that has happened now so aliphatic uh, amines they are the most suitable one for lcms application these will favor the singly charged analyte ions so the triethyl amine uh dimethyl uh, butyl amine tetra butyl amine they are all studied for uh, separation of uh, aromatic sulfonic acids so uh, let us remember uh, some of the uh, essential points so mass spectrometer is very brilliant analytical tool this back end good chromatography should never be neglected that means csi has a big role in terms of promoting the right chromatography practice for lcms uh, applications so uh, since electrostatic ionization depends on the solution chemistry you know in uh, classical mass spec the ionization happens inside the mass spectrometer whereas in uh, electrostatic ionization it have ionization happens outside the mass spectrometer it works in the atmospheric pressure that is the beauty of it otherwise you know inside the mass spec it is all you know black box and it is all under vacuum only that is the reason why it was more of a volatile organic compounds only used to go inside Because now you know because it happens in atmospheric pressure and uh, ionization happens outside the ring so solution uh, chemistry uh, plays a very big uh, role since it is a solution chemistry which defines the ionization there is a lot of scope to develop very versatile uh, mobile phases so for example you want to analyze uh, the a uh, compound which contains a carboxylic acid coh you make sure that you know you add uh, the little bit of base your uh, acid will be coo uh, minus and h plus it is in the ionized uh, state so it can easily enter into the mass spec so that way you know that ease of work was not there in the earlier uh, workflow with so this is why that is why i say this is a very important discovery that happened from uh, when the electrostatic ionization okay so many novel columns uh, which are specific to mass spectrometry and mass spectrometer and uh, drug discovery in mind uh, they have been designed to that rest like etc so many vendors you know they they have come up with the lcms uh, specialized columns so that is what is the i mean uh, they try to uh, uh, remove lot of metals etc in the silica very ultra pure silica they use so that you know these metals also if it is present in the mass spec you know you, you will not see the molecular ion again it will add the Uh, very minute uh, sodium potassium whatever the metal even iron magnesium all the small mala uh, uh, metal also will give an attack and you will get confused so people they have come up vendors have come up with the specifically designed uh, columns for mass spec so mass spectrometry can be utilized to get a lot of information by proper combination of solution chemistry and column chemistry 
that's the point i'm trying to highlight on this slide so you know that lactose fermentation has become a very uh, versatile uh, technique by default lc ms means uh, it is the small column uh, hplc and uh, uh, lactose fermentation so how do you choose how which molecules will uh, get ionized properly if you have a non polar uh, more of a non polar molecules and uh, smaller uh, molecular weight this will go into more of a gcms uh, domain so you cannot uh, try them on to the mosfet especially this area you know very small molecules let's like, say uh, 100 200 ones and they are highly non polar they are alkyl uh, groups and almost they won't be available in uh, uh, mosfet so you have to put them in the gcms way but there is an intermediate phase where you know unlike polarity is big polarity and the molecular weight of the thousand is this apci uh, mass spectrometry i say that you know this uh, equivalent of the uh, chemical ionization that will cover this phase apci that means up to thousand molecular weight and big polarity apci also can give the uh, good results you will see the beautiful polarity I mean almost you know when uh, uh, less than the big polarity to very uh, highly polar and right from small molecule to all the way to 100000 this electro spray mass spectrometry is the big data uh, here api electro spray mass spectrometry so that is the reason why it has become a uh, very popular and uh, most defaultly uh, used uh, technique so what are the acquisition modes there are various uh, experiments that are being thought of to so because you know it is a uh, HPLC is one part. Once you put the volatile mobile phase, put a small column and inject the sample, everything is uh, done. It will go into the mass spec now. But uh, to have a more uh, informative analysis, you on the mass spec end also you will have to design as to how you want to look at the data. For example, you have a it's a detector, it's a camera. It will look at the things, but you will have to choose the camera parameters correctly. If you want to choose the, the black and white mode, you will see the black and white uh, picture. If you want to choose the color mode, you will see a color picture. So there are all different different options which you will have to choose in the camera setup. So in, in analogy to that, in the mass spec, full scan acquisition is TIT, which is equivalent to you know just running the plain HPLC, but the det detection uh, along with your UV, you can also get the detection of the uh, is uh, ion. so the ion current will be continuously recorded which will be full scan acquisition tit so this is a very very uh, basic raw data for the mass spec so called uh, meta data and further software will uh, use this data to decipher lot of further information so then the selected ion monitoring in the tit you can make little bit of more sensitive because this is uh, less sensitive if you want to improve the sensitivity instead of looking at all the ion let us say my molecule is uh, having the 300 molecular weight you define uh, previously in the software itself let the mass spec look only at 300 m by z so that is the fit selected ion monitoring so whenever there is a 300 ion is coming into the mass spec it will record that correct so that will how uh, the peak will form for the fit then the selected reaction monitoring it's called srm sir okay then uh, that means you are doing only uh, one ion sigma and srm sir they are synonym i think they i don't have to make them two points it's only one point they are different names only but this multiple uh, reaction oh sorry i missed it uh, in selected reaction monitoring in the sim you can define only one ion okay whereas in uh, selected reaction monitoring you can define multiple ion so for example i want to look at 300 as my mass when i expect that there is another component there as uh, 200 so let the mass spec look at 300 ion also 200 ion also that is the uh, the selected uh, reaction monitoring so how much ever the ions you want to uh, define you can define and uh, put them it will be useful in terms of uh, analyzing the metabolite etc in the biological uh, fluids along with the parent ion you can define all the metabolites ion you can simultaneously monitor all of them then comes this multiple reaction monitoring MRM. This multiple reaction monitoring is a very very uh, important uh, detection uh, technique. We, what you do here, I was telling you there will be uh, quarter poles in the mass spec, and I also said that you know there is a the triple quarter pole, single quarter pole, double quarter pole, triple quarter pole. 
is a very uh, common terminology which you will be hearing. What prospect you have? I have a triple quarter pole. So in that triple quarter pole, there will be two quarter poles to for the analysis. There will be one quarter pole which is for the filtering purpose. So on the first quarter pole, I would have I would have given a cartoon here that would have been better. So there will be a first uh, uh, quarter pole uh, in which you know that uh, SRM will happen, selected reaction. That means I will choose then a one of the ions, 300, 200, whatever it is, and it will go to the uh, next quarter pole where it will get fragmented into its components, and uh, there will be many ions there. In the third quarter pole, it will run all those ions, or you can choose one of the ions. So you can make a pair of two ions, one from the parent, one from the fragmented one. That is the daughter ion it is called. That pair will give you the highest uh, sensitivity for uh, analysis. And most of the work will be done using the MRN technique. And this is neutral loss and neutral gain technique. And uh, certain molecules, they, they will uh, lose uh, some components. Say, for example, uh, we talk of glucuronide. You know, 176 is the neutral loss. That the glucose component will go away as a complete molecule uh, when you fragment it to the prospect. That will be the neutral loss. So that will uh, very specifically identify certain loss or gains into the molecule that will help you to study what is happening to the molecule. And there are two uh, modes there. One is the positive mode, another is the negative mode. I say if you want to analyze the carboxylic acid, you will be having DOA. So you will have to analyze in the negative uh, mode. If you are having amides, etc., that will get the uh, You will have to analyze that in the positive mode. Okay, you are by looking at the molecule, you will find out whether you are in the positive mode or a negative mode uh, to be used. So how do you use the MOSFET uh, uh, data to interpret the result? You It's fine, you run an LCMS, you get the result and you choose all these uh, ionization techniques, how to use and all those things. But to decide that, you will have to do a little bit of basic study on the molecule itself. And when you just uh, inject the, you put the sample into the mass spec, it will give you the mass spectrum. Okay, mass spectra, mass spectrum. So in that, you will find, for example, your molecule contains a chlorine. You will see that there will be two uh, peaks in the mass spec, which will be having one is to three uh, intensity. One is at 35 and 37. You know that chlorine is having uh, two, uh, one isotope at 37, one is 35. So naturally, 35. So both will be appearing in 1 is to 3 ratio because natural abundance is very high there. So 1 is to 3 abundance. So if you, any time you see a 1 is to 3 peak in your uh, mass spec when you do the analysis, it's a, especially in a metabolic study and all, you can immediately suspect, oh, this is a chlorine containing molecule here, yeah, then let us look at it. Okay, then bromine also similarly, 1 is to 1 uh, peak at 79, 81. If there is a carboxylic acid in the group, then when you are talking about a benzoic acid, etc. In the mass spec, immediately you will see along with the parent peak, uh, another peak at uh, uh, 44 Dalton's less. That is due to loss of carboxylic acid. If there is a uh, uh, molecule, uh, there is an amine in that, NH2 group is a left annually, then you will immediately see a 17 loss. There is the amine. Then hydroxy, you have a phenol, let us say. Then uh, immediately you can see an 18 loss. Then there are these uh, phosphate, uh, I mean, uh, uh, many compounds, uh, phosphate salt also are there, but you will see a 98 loss. But it is not always the parent molecule. There will be appearing, you know, a lot of uh, adducts that will be appearing. So these uh, sodium will give you 22, 42, 66. That is all, it, don't get confused. That this all will happen inside the mass spec. So you have to use your uh, prior knowledge to decide what is this one. Potassium will get 38, asteroid oil 41. Uh, like that, you know, you can go on assigning the different attacks and one has to have that prior information. So, uh, let us understand a little bit of uh, ionization uh, basics. This development of LCMS technique, it depends on the uh, ionization efficiency itself. And that's the reason I was telling you, if you have the phosphate salts and it will put the cotton plate and all. So, ionization efficiency will come down. So, we have to make sure that ionization efficiency is very high. And most classical LC mover based consists of phosphate mover, which we I explained to you that uh, because of the difficulty, it has to be just changed into the non volatile buffer. So LCMS mobile phases need to be volatile buffers. So this ESI will uh, do on the solution chemistry. So you design the mobile phase. How the ESI works? I say this uh, HPLC mobile phase enter from uh, the HPLC component. First, there will be a small uh, 
needle here which will be having a very high voltage you know it is uh, up to 3000 to 5000 uh, volt uh, voltage current will be applied here so and there will be a gap there will be a nebulizing uh, catch in it so the catch will remove all the aqueous components and it will enter onto the needle which i was telling you of 5000 uh, kilo volt uh, is it there because of this uh, high voltage there will be a droplet uh, formation and these uh, droplet uh, when they are uh, formed and you know that uh, there is a prior ions uh, that are present and as you go on splitting the neutral components the ions will start uh, appearing to the surface in this ionization uh, chamber that steam component what i was showing this is what is the ionization uh, chamber and uh, you will start uh, getting all the ions uh, exposed here because of this uh, high voltage and uh, this gas phase uh, ions are generated this process you know first there will be a big droplet then it will be going on uh, forming a smaller and smaller uh, uh, droplet this is called as coulombic explosion in this coulomb when the coulombic explosion happens because of this very very uh, high voltage and all the neutral components will go and because of the orthogonal structure all the neutrals will just filter off down and only the gas phase ions will come near the mosfet and this one is called a uh, curtain plate it is something like our cake you know it is, it is very very small aperture uh, opening and it will let only the charged ions into the mosfet that's how you know in the atmospheric pressure in the atmospheric uh, in the regular atmosphere uh, all the ionization happens and the ions will just enter into the uh, mosfet the ms will start here there will be first quarter pole then there will be a second quarter pole then there will be a third quarter pole at the end this is the basic of uh, esi how it works okay so as i explained it is a, there is a need for a very high throughput uh, drug discovery earlier you know there is uh, fda etc regulators so they were very friendly with the industry but uh, long ago there was a very big issues of uh, this uh, freedom that was given to scientists and one of the epileptic uh, drug very early in the day they uh, just uh, took the innovator molecule then they just said that you know we bend the generic version and uh, they left it to the market and uh, there was lot of you know adverse reaction that happened uh, then uh, investigation showed that you know they just took the invent uh, generic version and uh, they left it and did not compare with the inventor so that is why this when uh, concept came in by the regulators stringent risk evaluation and mitigation strategy so that is we need to you big big dossiers like how you submit the tmf and all big dossiers you will have to submit inda and uh, anda everything will be submitted so that is why attrition rates are very very high because of these stringent regulations okay so the pipelines are very fast uh, drying up there is a the, there is a patent clip that means uh, many many are uh, coming out of patent and new molecules are not coming out so that uh, there is a budget constraint will be there so that is why industry is uh, very much under uh, pressure there is a need for two more with uh, less kind of thing okay and we the analytical people we are the decision makers if we say molecule is not passing it will not go into the further development stage so uh, having understood so much of background let us quickly understand how is the workflow and not spend too much time on this uh, The, as i explained there will be various analyzers there top is there yes i is there if you are depending on your requirement and sensitivity needed and all you will have to choose the first the correct mosfet and uh, triple quad is the best one uh, which is uh, used for uh, pk etc so that uh, uh, very dynamic range is very high and uh, traps are most useful for metal work and uh, in traps very important thing is you know you can go on fragmenting the ions further and up to the end stage Uh, first ion will appear you take that one again you uh, ionize again you ionize like that so then there are some hybrid systems are also there trap and uh, uh, esi then the top is mostly workflow because of the accurate uh, mass and uh, two important uh, workflows met id is a classical workflow you take the full scan analysis then extract the ions and do the msms and understand the metabolic protective structure then you say synthesize them and confirm the structure this is how the met id work is uh, done okay then uh, but uh, if you don't know the details and a lot of my you know, things are not there there is a intelligent 
data analysis systems are there software can uh, uh, really do so you acquire most of the raw data like i said tic once you do the tic then you generate uh, the based on the tic you generate the mnemonics that need to be used for sensitive analysis and uh, you software itself will design what are mrms that can be used and again it will rerun the second run with mrm so all things will get automated and generate you the very good uh, metadata information but uh, very uh, important uh, limitation for mock tech is sample to be very very pure that means uh, sample purification techniques are very very important chromatography is one component but before chromatography you will have to purify the sample as much as possible and when i am talking of uh, drug discovery application e- even for that matter uh, in the pharmaceuticals a lot of these uh, tablets uh, serums uh, injections if you want to analyze it will have lot of excipients and other components right the rd in the discovery scenario the biological fluids etc so there will be lot of these protein uh, uh, like plasma etc will be there so uh, in the pre discovery scenario it is a protein precipitation which is used or in the pharmaceutical uh, scenario you just have to uh, you know f- filter the excipients precipitate them and filter it so you in the protein precipitation scenario simply you know you can take any of the organic acid and uh, this is all the protein will get uh, uh, denatured and uh, come out as a precipitate you take out the sample then people also use for liquid liquid extraction the tetra the tbme is one of the very important solvent that is used for uh, liquid liquid extraction then now uh, if you want to automate this solid phase extraction is very very uh, handy uh, either uh, you can do a semi clopic sp or uh, online sp so online online sp you can uh, have a uh, two columns uh, set up and there will be a switching wall so that you know the, you can uh, do the sp in uh, one column and uh, switch to the another column for analysis okay so this sp sp will uh, purify the molecule very well there is classic lc condition the columns are short column 50 to 2 mm then the several special column uh, geometries are available for polar molecules uh, you use uh, hydric uh, chromatography etc and typical mobile phase is 0.1% formic acid 10 mm or ammonium acetate and formic so the iron pairing agent you want to use volatile ioning agents uh, pentafluoropropanic acid cyclohexylamine these are the very popular ones i have used them in my work and uh, mobile phase uh, this is mobile phase a component that is the buffer component mobile phase b is very simple either astronetrile or methanol that is why yeah, it is very popular you know in the lcms solvent mm-hmm. astronetrile and uh, methanol are most popularly available then the flow rate is typically you know around 200 to 400 microliter notice huh? you are talking of 400 microliter per minute 0.4 ml whereas you know in uh, classic uh, case it is uh, up to 1.5 ml uh, you put in so look at the amount of uh, solvent saving that will happen with the lcm mostly mrm detection techniques we use so uh, uh, these are the uh, hardware uh, explanation that was happening all this time let us switch uh, to a little bit of application right now and this application side uh, is uh, i'm just listing out what all kind of applications that are i i need not uh, you know uh, dwell through all of them so uh, the high speed synthetical property training because you know uh, drug uh, when you we call it as nce research right new chemical entity research you know you are preparing you know thousands of thousands of uh, nce and uh, they need to be uh, having a proper solubility uh, property first if it is not very soluble then uh, it cannot even uh, pass through the first funnel so you will have to if you are uh, making a library of 100 compounds let's say in a, a combinatorial chemistry or parallel synthesis all the 100 compounds you will have to test for the uh, good solubility of that you will have to find out you know uh, how many solubility what i mean is you know it is not like you know you put a salt in water and you become a clear solution that is not the definition of solubility here yeah, it is uh, having a solubility of you know 100 micromolar 200 micromolar 500 micromolar kind of uh, that kind of solubility that it is that will happen only through the lcm and the high throughput fashion then the uh, protein binding studies you will have to do the protein binding is nothing to do with proteomics here because if you develop a drug molecule and if you take that uh, let's say you take a tablet the moment it goes into the uh, blood stream 
immediately it will encounter only the, the proteins there and the uh, drug molecule will go and bind uh, to those proteins. If it is bound and if the drug is not available uh, for, uh, for the treatment, that means that molecule is not good. So, this uh, protein binding is a very, very important characteristic which we have to study at the very uh, beginning of uh, your uh, discovery cascade. Then next comes is the microsomal severity. You develop a lot of molecules, but the, the moment it goes into the biological system, if it gets metabolized, you cannot uh, uh, use that for further development. So microsomal severity has to be studied as early as possible. Then uh, even uh, you, if you pass this uh, red block, then you go to this uh, next block, uh, you will have to study the pharmacokinetics. So you will have to study it as early as possible into the animal study. So the high-speed pharmacokinetic analysis, this is phenotyping, enzyme kinetic studies, and glucuronidation assay. I may discuss one or two examples in this. The disposition studies and metabolic biosynthesis are uh, and a further corollary. I will not discuss these examples. Okay. So that solubility screening, what you need to do is the, uh, there will be two kinds of solubility you will be studied. One is the kinetic solubility, another is the thermodynamic uh, solubility. And the uh, typical experiment is, you know, in uh, acidic, neutral and basic pH, you put the molecule and uh, you the, then uh, incubate it for, uh, let's say, uh, uh, half a day, two hours, three hours, you standardize that. Then they take the supernatant and uh, do the analysis. On the supernatant, how much uh, drug has come in? In the acidic medium, how much has come in? Neutral medium, how much come in? Basic uh, medium, uh, how much has come in? Based on that, you can determine what is the uh, nature of solubility of that molecule. That uh, information will be utilized for further experiments. And this you can do a multiplexed uh, assay. Maybe you can make a, a mixed uh, thing. Maybe you can uh, take 10, 12 compounds at a time and uh, use them in the, the MRM assay so that you, know, you can get the information in one shot for more number of molecules. Then you can rank order the solubility and uh, choose the best ones for further development. Okay. So then uh, protein binding studies, I said that uh, it is very important. There are uh, two ways of uh, doing. One is the rapid equilibrium uh, dialyzer. Another is the ultra filtration uh, method. In Singapore, uh, I have used the rapid equilibrium uh, dialyzer uh, method. And this assay is standardized on a 40 weight well performance. That means you can do a lot of molecules in uh, using the multi channel pipe. You can do a lot of compounds. And uh, protein precipitation method is used to do the analysis. Okay. So once you uh, get through this filtrate, after passing through the equilibrium di dialyzer, then you know that how, ma how many molecules uh, have come out of the dialysis membrane and uh, uh, at what concentration it has come in. That will give you a fair idea of, you know, that uh, in uh, when you take in the body fluid, how uh, that will behave. Yeah. Because, you know, you that membrane, you can also keep uh, human plasma in one component and uh, buffer in another component, volatile buffer, you can say. Then put the molecule in the human plasma. So after the uh, binding, whatever is unbound, that will come into the next compartment. That is how you find out what is the binding uh, nature of the uh, molecule. Okay. So if uh, matrix is uh, less, no, that mouse plus mind of will be very less. So then we can do some kind of uh, extrapolated uh, calculation based on the free fraction that is uh, available. This ultra filtration, uh, I have not done it. Uh, the people use this uh, using use ultra centrifuge or uh, the miniature version is uh, this artificial uh, member, immobilized artificial membrane, IA in protography. The column itself, they would have put the uh, membrane. So you can pass through the column, then in the free fraction will come out. Then the positive control is uh, warfarin is uh, used because you know it uh, binds very much. Then the microsomal uh, stability assay. You can use uh, human liver microsome, HLM, mouse liver microsome, rat liver microsome, RLM, or even the uh, F9 uh, fraction. That is, you homogenize the liver and you collect the uh, fraction corresponding to the uh, ninth fraction. That is the F9 fraction. I mean, during that process. So these are the common index that are used for microsomal stability. So you simply incubate your molecule with one of these uh, chosen uh, matrix and then uh, your uh, drugs will undergo uh, metabolism in those, uh, because of those enzymes. Then uh, you can have also have uh, different uh, cofactors. If you want to understand the phase one uh, metabolites, you know, you'll have to have NADPH cofactor. 
And if you want to look at the phase 2 uh, metabolite, that is the glucuronide, this UDPGA is used as a uh, cofactor. Okay, so the drug is typically incubated in 2 to 10 micromolar range and the cofactors are in 1 to 2 micromolar. Then you take the aliquot and put it into the mass spec and you estimate the percentage they may you take at different different time points so at different time points uh, uh, how much uh, drug is uh, remaining and uh, or uh, how much metabolite is formed so based on that uh, classic plot you can understand uh, the metabolic uh, profile of that you can calculate the t half time concentration uh, profile this t half is one indicator of uh, stability of the molecule uh, that is the microsomal stability experiment but uh, I say that uh, TAC is a very uh, raw data you use, but you know, based on the software help itself, you can go on improving the uh, detection uh, sensitivity. This is one uh, classic example I'm showing you here, that uh, close up is analyzed using the uh, LCMS, and it forms a uh, metabolite uh, where it will lose this methyl group. It's called NPL chelation. Methyl is attached on the uh, nitrogen, so this MD alkylation uh, is the uh, metabolite that is uh, formed and the mul molecule has a mass of 327.1376. That is the accurate mass. Uh, normally when you say molecular weight, you say 327.1 <laughs> uh, uh, single digit. But when you want to use accurate mass, that will give a lot of uh, information. I just explain you that. So this particular metabolite is having an accurate mass of 330.1219. So this three CS3, uh, the accurate uh, mass uh, will be uh, utilized, and uh, this there will be a concept called uh, mass shape. Then there will be, uh, depending on the isotopic uh, mass, there will be a mass defect will be there. Let us not get into that too much now because that itself will be a different uh, subject of discussion. This mass defect is uh, used as a filter in the mass spec. That is called the uh, mass defect filter. So when you apply mass defect filter, you get a very uh, sensitive peak that is coming in. Let us see a step by step. Now you have acquired a TAC here. You are seeing just some bits everywhere. Okay. Now you see. What I did is, I have initially run one uh, background, uh, the, only the blank run. Okay. The software can remove that background uh, subtraction. Software can do the background subtraction. The moment you do background subtraction on this, you will see that at 10 minutes, a peak is appearing, which is just uh, submerging here. Even on this hump, there is a peak that was uh, submerged, that is also appearing. So that means all the uh, background has uh, gone out, and uh, these are the peaks which are big. So this uh, sensitivity is not yet sufficient. Then then go for uh, next level, then it is a uh, software-based uh, coda algorithm will be there. Because of the coda algorithm, now you have removed a lot of... Uh, noises in the, uh, the spectrum. So you will see one peak here and one peak here and this has equal to two peaks here. Then you go to the uh, next stage, then you know that you have seen there is a chlorine in this uh, molecule, in the clozapine molecule. I told you earlier, uh, the moment there is a chlorine in the molecule, there will be one H2, three uh, the ions that can be seen. So you just tell software that, you know, I am expecting a chlorine in my metabolite. Immediately it will apply, it will apply a chlorine isotope uh, filter to the whole acquired uh, data. The moment you say that, you know, look, yeah, this is a peak here which contains the chlorine. This is a peak here which contains the chlorine. This is a peak here which contains the chlorine. That means in my molecule, after my experiment, I am able to find out three metabolites by using all these different different the basic is simple uh, chromatography. It is a mass spec which has made and the software which has made all the tricks. Now you classical way of identifying a molecule was by radio chromatogram. So if you had run uh, this whole thing as a radio chromatogram, you would have seen one, two, three, three peaks. Right? The grand, it's matched. Yeah. So you know classically it's very difficult to set up the uh, radio chromatography and uh, it requires a lot of uh, regulatory approvals and there's a health hazard. So LCMS has uh, uh, displayed rather or it has uh, complemented very well to the radio program. So before, without running the radio program, you, upload, you got the same information. That's the beauty of it. So the accurate mass capability, it reduces the matrix effect, signal improves, background subtraction you need, 
isotope uh, filter you apply and uh, you need a high resolution uh, cryptography and you got this thing. Okay, then uh, let us uh, quickly go for a uh, high speed uh, PK analysis uh, how it is done using this LCMS. I showed you that uh, my whole setup uh, is used uh, to do the lot of uh, PK studies and these are all the uh, experiments uh, done by my own hands in uh, Singapore. We, we had a developed a drug discovery uh, program uh, for a cancer metabolism program, uh, we did a study. So there were uh, uh, 300 studies that were accomplished. Let us just go one by one here. So what are the unit operations that are involved if you want to do a high-speed uh, PK uh, program? And uh, this learning is applicable for any other thing also. Huh? So you can just uh, understand the underlying principle, that's all. So this uh, unit operation is first you do the multi task, okay. Then you optimize the process. Then cut down the unnecessary steps. That means you do the way you are doing first time in terms of right from sample processing all the way up to the analysis. Then you see how all you can improve your uh, process. You know, the very small thing like, you know, then where do you keep your reagents and where do you keep your pipette? That itself will uh, matter a lot. Uh, all your samples and uh, wires, etc. to be easily available on your left hand. All your pipettes, etc. should be easily available on your right hand. Your elbow should be resting on the table. You know, all these small, very small, minute, trivial things will help you to improve the output very much. Your hand will not be trained. You know, you are not wasting your time moving the hand here and there. And uh, then you don't miss the rhythm. Because, you know, you become more of a machine when you do the high throughput study. Okay, that is the uh, unit operation. Then you upstream process is the optimal blood sampling to achieve the serial sampling in most models. Because if you go and go to mouse and take the sample, you cannot simply draw, you know, in, uh, one one ml. You know, if we go to our diagnostic center and when they take the blood, we all say, but you know, you took so much of blood from me. And then you, you will just imagine, you know, the mouse such a small thing. So you cannot just draw uh, how much over the mouse you want. So you have to uh, take, you know, 100 microliter, 200 microliter kind of sample. So all these have to be optimized. Then the sample organization is great, that's what I just explained. And uh, bioanalytical method, you develop uh, the, all these, uh, you know, you you have different, different metrics there. Blood is there, plasma is there, the, the various tissues are there, liver, brain, tumor. So how to process them? All these things you will have to first pre-optimize. Then the workflow will become uh, very simple. So uh, it will be a process-driven workflow to which will help you to do the high throughput uh, screening. And this program it has generated, you know, uh, successful partnering deal worth several million. We licensed the cancer metabolism program to Jensen. So I did 300 studies in just 15 months without having any very high, uh, uh, very high uh, automation. So these are the kind of profiles that will be generated after doing all these. Now you look at here, plasma, tumor, brain, all the uh, profiles have been done. Here is just one example. You can see how the profile looks like. So this is uh, just a uh, picture to uh, to feel what I was talking about. So it is a 24 well optimized uh, processing. So I would be sitting, my work table will be somewhere in the center here. So then uh, there will be these 24 well uh, plates are there. I have taken miniature uh, tubes here and organized them uh, in such a way that, you know, first row will be the calibration one, second row will be the, the samples, then third row will be in between, there will be a quality control samples, like that you see. And this is my MOSFET uh, plate and these are the, my samples first. Sample also have to be organized in a right uh, well format so that, you know, these multi-channel pipettes can easily take the sample here and directly put it here without any uh, readjustment. So that is how you have to uh, plan. And if you want to have uh, the, the samples in a cold thing, the cooled uh, racks also will be available in the lower picture. You can uh, see that. And this, all these uh, processed samples, this will go and sit into the rack here and uh, analysis happens through this uh, robot in 96 well plate or uh, yeah, 96 well format. Okay. And this is uh, just a uh, the operation, uh, this thing, the operator where you do the precipitation, you remove all the liquid uh, using the nitrogen. So look at the chromatogram, I mean, look at the calibration curve that we are uh, generating. It's a 
टू नैनोमिक रेंज फाइव ऑर्डर टू नैनोग्राम पर एम एल टू टेन थाउजेंड नैनोग्राम आई थिंक ऑलमोस्ट टेन कैलिब्रेशन पॉइंट परफेक्टली लीनियर यू कैन सी पॉइंट नाइन नाइन सेवन एंड एन एल ओ क्यू यू कैन डिटेक्ट दिस टू नैनोग्राम पर एम एल विथ लॉट ऑफ कॉन्फिडेंस सिग्नल टू नॉइज रेशो इज मोर दैन थ्री सिग्नल टू नॉइज रेशो इज वन ऑफ द डिटर्मिनिंग फैक्टर टू ऑप्शन वेदर यू कैन गो दैट लो और नॉट एंड दिस इज द टू नैनोग्राम and uh, you can generate the data in very high throughput mode but you know if you don't automate your uh, data analysis again you will be uh, stuck you know i had made just a simple uh, excel sheet and you just have to paste your uh, raw data uh, highlighted uh, so that others will not go wrong where to paste the data it is all highlighted also and once you do that you just click on the sort there is a macro you all must be knowing excel macros so you just uh, design that excel macro Just paste the data here. Pack up your data will be analyzed, and your uh, even the profile will be generated. This profile will directly go into the uh, feedback loop uh, to our uh, animal study uh, people. I will give the information of this uh, C max, T max, T half, whatever is coming. So based on your uh, uh, concentration achieved here, the time it is remaining into the body, they will design the molecule further. Okay. So then. Uh, there are these uh, i was telling you molecules will undergo metabolism also if you want to analyze the uh, unknown uh, metabolite when uh, we anal- do the analysis see my parent molecule was uh, 207 that is the standard i had injected and when i put uh, the uh, sample into the lcms i was expecting to get the result of this 207 i don't see any peak of that uh, 207 at all so then what i did I had acquired already this uh, DI, you know, and then uh, when I analyzed what all the other ions are of the cell, I could find an ion which is 173, and uh, the uh, circulating uh, metabolite in the uh, sample. So I quickly uh, reanalyzed my same sample using this uh, 177. I immediately got the uh, results. You know, it is not just uh, not matching to the parent; uh, it is a different thing. So. using uh, this information i could save that today you know because you know animals you know you are uh, using them and ultimately you are culling them so it is not fair if you don't get information out of that uh, data so you rerun the same sample you got the information that uh, my i put the molecule 207 into the uh, animal and uh, what i saw is a uh, 137 which is a uh, metabolite uh, so my parent molecule is not at all stable now you will appreciate why microsomal stability study is very very important right at the beginning stage if you had done the microsomal stability study properly initial stage you would have seen that you know this molecule is not going to very stay in this uh, plasma so you better uh, don't even take it to the next stage that information would have had its way earlier stage itself that is the beauty of this uh, analysis okay so when i uh, changed that uh, my detection parameter uh, i uh, earlier uh, this one so this uh, concentration profile uh, it has come like this then uh, another component this is another example the profile has come like this you get the uh, metabolite has the uh, higher exposure than the uh, parent that is the information that uh, we could uh, do that and immediately you know they uh, changed the molecule uh, they introduced the uh, 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 modification into the molecule and they use it. So that is how you know front loading uh, that uh, macrosomal was important. Front loading micro metabolite identification is also very very critical. So uh, why front loading is uh, very very uh, important? You know, uh, you will see that you know metabolites uh, produce may be more active or uh, toxic. In my previous example, I showed you metabolite is produced. Uh, if it is toxic, if it is not toxic, it is fine. other if it is toxic right by the first dose uh, my animal would have uh, died you know the, and uh, if the molecule which comes into the uh, final stages at that time it becomes very very important you all must be remembering one of the studies uh, from uh, dr reddy that in earlier there was one adverse effect you know the head was bulging and all those things and the molecule was immediately recalled such kind of examples are there so that is why we we analytical scientists especially the drug discovery scientists have lots of lots of responsibility to give the right information for the development team okay so the more active metabolites are there which are pro drug 
that is okay so you because you know when it enters the gut let's say the tract and if it is uh, metabolizing there and uh, goes into the stomach uh, later and uh, that uh, active principle uh, is available for action so you uh, make a progress so that you know it will pass through the gut without metabolizing then it enters into the body or you change the route of administration so this uh, information will be very good uh, so this pro drug uh, active metabolites have direct implication in the clinical setting so for toxic metabolites this new molecular entities or np is new chemical entity they are they to be redesigned completely this this is a very classic example it is a simetidine you all must be uh, knowing uh, it is before omeprazole day Simetidin uh, was uh, very popular for acidity. I think even now uh, many people are uh, responding only to simetidin. It's a GSK drug and uh, it's a it has a very big significance. Sir. This is the first uh, blockbuster uh, drug that was uh, introduced in the market by GSK. And by the way, when I was in uh, GSK in uh, Mysore, it was called Miss Klein Bicha, not Miss Klein J. S K. Uh, it's kind of French. It was called SKF, and I worked on this molecule in Mysore in 1980. Okay, fine. So uh, this uh, precursor of semiconductor was uh, metiamine. Okay, you will see that you know it is a thiol group, C double bond uh, S group here, and because of this thiol, this was uh, very uh, this uh, fine amino group. This was very uh, toxic. Okay, then what they did is. They change the thiourea to thiol amino group. It's thiourea group. NH three double bond S NH. That they change it to NH three double bond S thiol amino group. The moment you make this uh, very small change into a molecule, the molecule becomes very stable. There is no adverse effect. You know, then I, uh, the semiconductor became a blockbuster uh, drug. Okay. That reason of this adverse reaction it was due to metabolism of this thiol carbonate to thiolic uh, thiol acid. Okay. So this front loading of uh, uh, several toxicity assays would have given early signs of ADR, and nowadays lot of toxicity studies at a very early stage. That is how you know lot of CROs have become very very busy. You go and talk to any CRO people, they they will be extremely busy. They will not be able to spend time with anyone. Uh, poor fellows, I think the sales people. My one of my colleague is sitting there. He will uh, appreciate that. You don't get appointment at all. <laughs> okay. Then this is Amrozil uh, in vitro studies. This is one uh, example which I will take uh, three four slides just to explain to you how logically you can uh, go on deriving the information. I mean, uh, I understand that a lot of students have uh, joined into the, uh, uh, the webinar today. I hope uh, they have not got bored and left the meeting. If they are already there, they all must be very feeling sad because PUBG got uh, uh, banned now. Okay. So uh, all these uh, mind games are there, no? They depends on lot of uh, logical uh, thinking, and I'm sure uh, yeah, they have have the very uh, good analytical mind to follow these uh, slides. So it is a pure uh, uh, logical, mathematical, arithmetical uh, implementation. So the amrozil thing, it is an antifungal agent. So it is a very old drug. It is administered as nail lacquer. That means to remove the fungal infection on the nail. Some people will be having that, like a lacquer. They apply it onto the uh, fingers. Okay, I think some of the ladies may appreciate you know that uh, the nail lacquers. Okay, so as part of our study, you know, when in, uh, in uh, Singapore we took this, we we used to do lot of studies to repurpose old drugs. So this amrozil uh, is the one which uh, we took uh, to study for uh, autoimmune property. So that is why uh, we studied this uh, metabolic uh, profile and all those things. So as part of our study, we identified uh, three metabolites. It's called putative metabolites. Three putative metabolites because we are not synthesized and confirmed that they are the putative metabolites. One is the M plus sixteen, uh, that is one OH. Then another is the M plus thirty uh, two, that is two OHs. And another is the M plus twenty uh, four. And uh, we studied their enzyme kinetics also. This the third twenty four M plus twenty four that will not directly fit into one of these either hydroxy or double hydroxy or amino NH two etc. Uh, so it is uh, uh, we don't know what it is as of now. So as you go along you will know what it is. So the 
they studied their enzyme kinetics also the this third point metabolite it was in fact a secondary metabolite is one of them to be again further degrading to get uh, this m plus 24 that is the conclusion we made out of uh, this study which i will explain you how we did that okay so i did the uh, msms of amrolfin okay and uh, molecular weight of amrolfin is 318 point uh, 370 so if this is the esi uh, plus okay so in my esi plus i'll see one i and more because the h will be added there so i will see 318.3 okay this 318.3 when you do a ms ms this is if you do only ms you see it only in uh, 318.3 you you may not see lot of further uh, peaks here but if you do an ms ms that means you in a controlled uh, environment you break this 318 then you will see lot of other uh, peaks here let us uh, look at the ions here 116 130 and 160 three ions here and there is a ion at uh, 175 and uh, 203 see 175 and 103 so some ions are uh, below the uh, 160 or major ions some are here so these are the five ions which we will concentrate on in the next okay So where is the amrolfin uh, structure? You will see this is the amrolfin structure. I am with the M plus H uh, uh, structure. Okay, and uh, you will see uh, this uh, uh, morphin uh, group. You will see a phenyl group here. Your isopentyl group is there, and there is a linker here. Uh, uh, three carbon linker is here. So th- when you fragment it, the fragmentation can be possible anywhere. Let us first understand the fragmentation pathway. Let us go uh, th- this mark. The fragment happens at the linker chain, carbon linker chain. So one ion is this. This is the uh, uh, this is the the cation which you will see 161 part. It's called propylium cation. Okay, this uh, whole part. Uh, this part is called propylium cation. This is the propyl group that is added. This mark will account for 161.2. Okay. And the other fraction that remains here is the morpholin uh, side, which will be 156.2, and this will be uh, unstable here because of this uh, double bond. These are all remember uh, they are all master ions only to be unstable. Okay, that that will uh, lose this uh, three double bond C 26, then it will give the uh, morpholin uh, cation here. Okay, and uh, this morpholin cation will uh, further uh, lose uh, this methyl group. Okay. Then it will give you 160. So we accounted for the structure of 160. We accounted for the structure of 160. We accounted for the structure of 161. Now there is another pathway. It's called concentrated pathway. Some of the uh, population will go this pathway. Some of the population will go the other way. It will break on the isopentyl group. You will see this uh, uh, intact uh, ion here along with the uh, phenyl and the morpholine group. Which is 248, and this uh, uh, isopentyl, which is 70 here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and uh, this will have, of course, for the break. And this 248, it will uh, uh, muslin will uh, open up, and there will be a 45 loss. Okay, so that will give you this uh, four-membered ring structure 203, and this being unstable further go down to a stable structure of uh, cyclopropyl uh, 175. So we accounted for the structure. We vaguely know. What are the structure of 135, 203, 115, 130, 161? Based on our chemistry information, this is nothing new. This is based on chemistry information. Now let us go to the uh, next slide, where uh, I say how is the metabolic pathway that you can think of to this metabolism. So the pathways are one is the hydroxylation. That hydroxylation can happen. That means in the plasma, the OH will get added. Hydroxylation means OH will get added. Where it can anywhere the CS3s are there, that can can get converted to CS2OH. So CS3 here, here, here. Anywhere OH can come. Okay. Then there is a CS3 here, CS3 here. So CS3 this OH can happen. Then this OH can happen. This OH can happen. So all these are possibilities. Okay. So now uh, let us fit them and uh, look how it looks. So generally, hydroxylation is. Uh, Happening on our seeding, let us say. On seeding, if there is a hydroxylation, what you will see are 334 ions. 
ओके एंड इफ ऑक्सीडेशन इज हैपनिंग नॉट हाइड्रोक्सीलेशन बट ऑक्सीडेशन एम प्लस प्रोटीन दैट इज ओनली पॉसिबल ऑन दिस अगेन सीविंग देयर इज अ कीटो फॉर्मेशन कीटो ऑन डॉल्फिन 332 देन दिस सिस्टम ओपन द रिंग रिंग ओपनिंग कैन हैपन एम माइनस पार्टी दैट इज 278 मार्सलिन रिंग ओपन and this is a intermediate uh, thing where hydroxylation happens and then the ring uh, uh, opens so there is a two changes here so that will become uh, m uh, the 294 secondary metabolite so that is how we accounted for you know the primary metabolite n plus 16 and n plus 14 one secondary metabolite which was 294 this is how the comes to know what could be the possible uh, metabolic rate of the molecule See, this is the uh, information we got, but uh, in the mass spec, uh, that actually hard evidence will be there. What uh, we run then, hydroxylation on ring C1, uh, uh, in the uh, this 334, will form this uh, 138, uh, 128, and 161. And uh, if you look at the parent, these are two different runs. I have just put uh, one above the other. In the parent, 318, uh, 161 is there, 130 is there. Okay, so. This uh, this one is uh, 130 is uh, losing this uh, two ions which is accounting for 138. Okay, the CS3 will become double one, so two hydrogens will go. And 161 is remaining as 161. In the previous slide we have accounted 161 here, right? Ah, here we have accounted for 161. So between parent and metabolite, if 161 is remaining as it is, that means There is no change on that part of the molecule. Where is that 161 is coming? 161 is you know, this part of the molecule. This part of the molecule, which will become unchanged, right? That is how we say that you know that is not modified. This is remaining as it is. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I have the structure here. So this part is remaining as it is, and this part is uh, changing. That is how I can prove it. Same thing as uh, you know that uh, ketonization that has happened. So the 318 is the parent molecule, and 332 is the keto metabolite. So in this uh, ketonization of the ring, uh, what you will see is you know 161 is uh, completely uh, disappear, disappear. You don't see that, and uh, there is a change from this uh, 130 and become 138. This is a factor that will account for. Similarly, for the other one, hydroxylation with uh, ring opening, you will see that you know this 294 has formed, which is due to that this structure. And uh, you will see here 159.2. Just, just notice 161 is not at all there. It has become 159, which we have accounted for this kind of uh, structure. And this kind of structure is possible only when uh, ketonization is happening on this side. That is how we accounted 318 to 294 and 161 to 151. Marfan ring is opening and hydroxylation is happening. That is the conclusion we got. First, it opened here. Then it got hydroxylated. That is how we can account for this structure. That is the beauty of uh, interpretation. Then, when you extract the, uh, the chromatogram for these ions that uh, I was uh, showing, you know that uh, in the TIC you can extract different different ions. If you extract these ions, you can actually see these peaks there. Here, there is a 4.2 minute, 4.45 minute, 4.95 minute, and this is uh, at about 3.8 or something. Okay, all the ions uh, you actually physically saw in your uh, uh, plasma mixture metabolite, and using that you further study it and you make uh, that uh, plot of uh, your uh, fraction uh, formation rate versus the Ambrosian uh, uh, concentration. This is the typical uh, profile you will get for different different things, and uh, based on these profiles you can actually conclude how the uh, the metabolism is taking place. You know, you will see some of them are plateauing. Here, it is more plateauing because it is plateauing like this. We can conclude that it could be a secondary metabolite, etc. Okay, then you can take it for further conclusion. The metabolism so is happening, but you know what is the uh, cause? Which enzyme is doing the metabolism? There are, you know, that in the body there are various uh, enzymes are there. One A two, one B two, two D, three D six, and all those things. Out of which, CYP three eighty four is a very uh, major enzyme, and uh, most of the metabolism is happening using CYP three eighty four. Now, what we will do is we can just incubate them with the different. Uh, see, one A two inhibitor is the uh, furfural, 
and uh, 1A2 inhibitor is also alpha nephron. Then 2C9 enzyme inhibitor is the uh, sulfo. Then 2C19 inhibitor is there, yes, yes. And 2C19 inhibitor, then quinidine, that is uh, 2D6. So you put all those inhibitors and uh, and you also put the uh, 3A4 inhibitors, this uh, probe molecules. What you will see is, in all other uh, uh, probe molecule uh, with the inhibition, there is no metabolism that is taking place. Uh, it is remaining as same as the percentage control in the 100% range. Whereas in uh, 3A4, it has drastically come down as compared to control. It is uh, around 40% or something. That means only the Z3A4 enzyme, which is uh, responsible to bring the metabolism. All these things are not at all responsible for bringing down the metabolism. Okay? Fine. So, uh, one last example is the glucuronide uh, conformation. I was also talking about the neutral loss uh, scan. So, especially for the, see, all those the hydroxylation, uh, etc., they are the first pulse metabolites. Now, these are the, uh, the second uh, basic metabolites, okay? The glucuronides are very, very important from that uh, second phase, phase 2 metabolites, sorry. They are the phase 1 metabolites, these are the phase 2 metabolites. The phase 2 metabolites, uh, you know, after the happening, first metabolite, that is the hydroxylation or uh, amino thing, then it will get glucuronide because they become toxic, they will get uh, attached to the glucose molecule. That glucuronide uh, is soluble and that will easily go out of the system. That is why this glucuronation is very, very, very uh, important. So we studied this uh, glucuronide uh, metabolism in one of the studies there, where uh, we used uh, this uh, duracyl metabolite and uh, found out its uh, glucuronide uh, peak. This is an acyl glucuronide in Russia, which will classically uh, demonstrate to you. You know, you you first make a very long uh, gradient uh, run where you expect you know glucuronides are all uh, present there. Okay. Then you take the sample, you hydrolyze it. One, you hydrolyze using the uh, glucuronate enzyme, enzyme, uh, enzyme mediated hydrolysis. Another, you use uh, alkali mediated uh, hydrolysis. So, if the enzyme mediated, that glucuronate is, uh, mediated hydrolysis can happen and uh, the glucuronide uh, glucose will go away and it will give back the parent molecule. That is called erg glycan. So, if the uh, erg glycan is uh, remaining, that means uh, there is a uh, glucuronide, okay? If uh, everything is uh, going off, then, uh, oh, sorry, uh, there, you can see here, there are these acyl glucuronides, okay? You will see the peak here, 1.48, 4.32, etc. They are all uh, acyl uh, glucuronides. And this is the uh, glycan uh, peak. So in the uh, alkali hydrolyzed one, you will not see peaks at all. That means they are not acyl glucuronides, only these are the acyl uh, uh, glucuronides. So these are oocyl glucuronides. This is not the uh, oocyl glucuronide. It's like that. That's the conclusion. Okay. So in summary, the uh, drug discovery is a very time-consuming and uh, uh, brain-intense uh, work. I have introduced the concept to you, and I have introduced the basics of uh, cryptography. Okay. And then the, how the high throughput workflow is uh, done, and uh, there is always a need for uh, front loading of the. Uh, um, uh, all the studies like metabolic study, toxic study, etc. Then uh, this uh, semi-automated uh, workflow for uh, high-speed PK is uh, demonstrated, which is my own work in Singapore. Uh, I also uh, taught you net ID and enzyme kinetic studies, SIP peanut ID. So then I wanted to show this molecular weight determination of protein and all, but uh, uh, it is not very appropriate on this forum, that's why I just did not do that. But uh, in the slide, this one slides are there if uh, anyone gets the slide later can see that. And uh, disposition study also I did not uh, explain here. Uh, that uh, study also can be done on this. So this is how the things can be done on a CMS.